Welcome everyone, I am Jennifer Marshall, I'm the co-founder and executive director of This Is My Brave, and I am so glad you're all here today. Looking back at my high school and college years even, no one talked about mental health. So when my mental illness emerged in December of 2005, when I was 26, in the form of two terrifying manic episodes, my family was completely unprepared. I thought my life was over when I was diagnosed with type 1 bipolar disorder 14 years ago. For me, that rock bottom was the beginning of what eventually would become something beautiful, only I didn't know it at the time. It got worse before it would get better. Back then, isolated and afraid for my future, I wondered if life were worth living at all. I'd experienced a year of horrible clinical depression and two more manic episodes with psychosis during the years I was having my children. Twice, I had to be involuntarily committed to a psychiatric hospital taken from my home in handcuffs by police officers. Thankfully, I didn't let my struggle define me. Through blogging, I found recovery and the beauty and power in sharing my story, which led me to create This Is My Brave. The National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, reports that 50% of all lifetime mental illnesses develop by age 14 and 75% developed by age 24. Suicide is currently the second leading cause of death among our young people ages 10 to 24. If these statistics 
don't light a fire in your belly to do something to help address this teen mental health crisis, I don't know what will. To share with you how we got here to this moment, Christine and her leadership Napa Valley team contacted me in the fall of 2016 to inquire about producing a This Is My Brave show for Napa Valley. That show took place right here in May of 2017 and was a huge success, featuring 14 individuals, several of them young people. This time around, Christine and her team wanted a strong focus on youth. And because of the bravery, passion, and determination of these storytellers you're about to meet and their production of team mentors, we're here today. Every day, over 3,000 high school age students attempt suicide. The decade 2007 to 2017, the number of suicides among people ages 10 to 24 suddenly increased 56%. If we had kids suddenly dying at these rates from a new form of cancer or an infectious disease, there would be a huge uproar. This needs to be a call to action. What we've created here is a movement to show students that they're not alone in these struggles. There is help out there and treatment can work and that talking openly about these things is a good place to start. Today's performance is an incredible way for us to kick off This Is My Braves High School Initiative, our new Brave Ambassador program, you can read about it in your programs, which is our nationwide call for students to lead mental health awareness efforts in their schools and in their communities. We will be supporting and promoting the work of these teens during the 2020-2021 school year, and some of them will share their stories on our national stage in DC in the spring of 2021. We believe that we can save lives by shining a light on true inspiring stories of recoveries from students who are not only surviving, but thriving despite these mental health challenges. These brave students you're about to meet have come together to bring their stories of resilience and hope to the stage because they know their stories have the power to encourage their peers not to give up. It gets better. Help is out there. By opening up the conversation through, about mental health through storytelling, we're breaking down those unfair societal pressures that tell us perfection is key. It's okay to not be okay. By sharing our stories, we normalize the fact that our brains get sick sometimes too. And we need to be there for each other by having these real, honest conversations about how we're doing. Last fall, I was in Boise, Idaho for one of our shows there. After the last member had left, uh, last audience member had left the venue, the videographers, a husband-wife team, Carly and Brayden, were packing up their equipment. Before they left, Carly, with tears in her eyes, came up to me and hugged me and said, Jen, I have no doubt in my mind the work you're doing is changing the world. Then she told me her story. You see, if I've learned anything in these six years of doing this work, it's that when one person shares their story, it gives others the permission to do the same. I call it brave multiplying brave, which is why I'm so grateful to all of you for being here today. Our brave cast members today are joining our community of storytellers from all over the US and Australia who've decided to be brave and put themselves out there. Over 800 of them who have shared their truths on our stages in 67 shows to date. Our vision is to get to a place where we no longer have to call it brave for talking openly about mental health issues. We believe it should simply be called talking. So I'm gonna stop talking now and we'll get started. Please help me uh, in welcoming to the stage our co-producer of today's show, Jennifer King. Welcome to This Is My Brave, the show. Um, as mentioned, I'm Jennifer King. I'm a professor of theater at Napa Valley College, and I'm also the artistic director of the Performing Arts Center here. I'd like to thank everyone for coming today to witness the Napa Valley shine a light on mental health issues to end stigma. First and foremost, we'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Our 2020 season of shows wouldn't be possible without the support of our national sponsors, Allergan, Jansen, and Miundis. We also appreciate the generous support of our many local sponsors, Adventist Health St. Helena, Arts Council Napa Valley, Napa Valley College, St. Joseph's Health Queen of the Valley, the Staglin Family, American Medical Response, St. Helena Performing Arts Center, Napa County Health and Human Services, Clinic Olay, 
and the doctor's company. That's a lot. Let's have a huge applause for all that support. We'd also like to give a special thanks to videographer Albert Beneshu and his team from Denoise Studios in Berkeley and photographer Joe Villar with AirCam. We appreciate your support of the mission. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. If everyone could please take out your cell phone, and I know there are many in the house. We're a very social organization and we want you to take lots of pictures, selfies, even video clips and share these on your social networks with the hashtag, Storytelling Saves Lives. What you are about to experience defines what it means to live brave. And we need your help to tell the world we're here and they can learn what it means to live brave too. So share away, don't be shy. Our volunteers will do their best to retweet and regram as many posts as possible to help extend our reach. We also have mental health workers present today. Um, if you're in the house, would you please stand? There we are, they're waving over here and over here. Uh, they will be uh, both in the house and outside after the performance should you need someone to talk to. Since This Is My Brave is a storytelling organization, I thought it would make sense to tell you the story of how I learned about This Is My Brave and my reason for getting involved. Alcoholism and mental illness runs deep through both sides of my family. I have lost many friends and family far too young due to addiction. While I was spared a substance abuse problem, I was plagued with anxiety. But with the proper help, I live a very fulfilling life. So when This Is My Brave Napa Valley, when that team approached the Performing Arts Center about doing This Is My Brave, a youth show, I knew I wanted our relationship to be deeper than a mere rental. I wanted Napa Valley College Performing Arts to become a co-collaborator. And with the help of a supportive dean, uh, mental health services here at Napa Valley College, and our school administration, we were able to create a marvelous partnership, and the result is what you will see today. And personally, it has been a privilege to serve as a co-producer. We're about to take you on a journey. You will laugh, and you will cry. You will be enlightened, inspired, and our hope is that you will leave with a transformed perception of the invisibleness of mental illness, thanks to the bravery of our cast members. Today we are hearing stories from people 14 to 24 because mental health is a critical issue for young people. Because this is the reality. 20% of adolescents and young adults have or will have a serious mental illness in any given year. 50% of mental health problems are established by age 14 and 75% by age 24. Suicide is the leading cause of death among those 15 to 24. But because we don't talk about mental illness, people often suffer in silence. This changes today, right on this stage. We are shining a light on mental illness to show the world that we are your friends, colleagues, neighbors, community members. We hope that through our storytelling, you will, be, you will better understand mental illness and you will be able to be supportive to those in your life who may experience it. You may be inspired to share your own story. It's when we share our stories that we start the conversation and storytelling saves lives. So, Let's get started. Hello. I started out wanting to talk about an issue that is of great importance to me at the moment. An issue that makes my blood boil, but saddens me all at the same time. However, what I had written before was full of anger, and I soon realized that I wanted to talk about so much more. 
I felt if I was being given a chance to have a voice, then I wanted to get the most out of this opportunity. So here's my story. I don't have a story where something horrible and tragic happened to me because of my depression. There are so many more heartbreaking stories out there, and I hope you listen with an open heart when he and, and mind when hearing those stories. But my story is a little different. This is a story about how my journey with depression has made me stronger. Picture a 12-year-old girl sitting in her room and wanting to end her life and not knowing why. She so desperately wanted to understand why she felt this way, why she was always so scared, nervous, and anxious all the time. Why was she different? Truthfully, deep down, she had always known why. I was that girl. I never told anybody because I wanted to help myself first. So I did. I would research ways on how to help myself, and along the way, I figured out that my two outlets were music and writing. When I was younger, my depression was triggered by things that, as an adult, I now feel silly about because it was all about the teenage drama, boys, occasional bullies, and my two biggest triggers, school and body image. Even though these may seem silly, just remember that if you aren't now, we were all teenagers at some point and things affected us differently than they do now. If only I could tell my teenage self to keep holding on because life was just going to get harder. At the age of 17, I graduated high school in 2014. Life quickly began to change for me, and shortly after graduation, I started college. I began driving, began tasting freedom. A lot of things happened in that time frame. I was finally popping the bubble I was living in and exploring the world around me. While in college, I discovered a whole new level of stress. I was stressing because I so badly wanted to pass all six of my classes. I really wanted my parents to be proud of me. I began working my first jobs, and I learned the struggle of working and being a student at the same time. I had all this stress laying on my shoulders, and I had no idea what to do with it. And it was like this for the first three years of college. Nobody understood how I was feeling, and I felt guilty for complaining about having a job and going to school, but truthfully, I had no idea what I was doing. Adding on to this, my music classes were becoming a burden. I couldn't pass one class out of all of my music classes, even after taking it multiple times, and I began to feel like a failure. Failing that class multiple times changed something inside of me, and I began to lose passion in the things I used to love, Getting out of bed became harder every day. My classes weren't until 2 in the afternoon, so I would stay in bed and do nothing. When I began falling into my depression again, no one noticed because I was home alone during the day. It was my best kept secret. On top of school, I was in an emotionally abusive relationship. That relationship lasted a little over six years. Honestly, I'm ashamed that I had let a man degrade me the way that he did, which only added to the body image issues. He was six years older than I was, and even though people might say I got myself into that situation, sure, you may be right, but a real man would never call me the names that he did. Names like dumb, fat, ugly, and he said that I would look better if I dressed a certain way or if I weighed a certain amount. But long story short, I left him after six long years because I knew my worth and I knew that he was a toxic person in my life. Shortly after leaving that relationship, I met the man who is now my husband. I was finally happy again. After months of losing myself, I began to find the person who was hiding within me. When I met my husband, he encouraged me to stay in school and not take a break. He promised to support me in any way he could. So I decided to change my major to English. It was a whole new world for me, and I loved it. After only six months of dating, my husband proposed to me, and three months later, we were married. We've been married ever since, believe it or not. <laughs> Depression was left behind, and I was loving these feelings of happiness. That is until things took another turn. Shocking, right? Three or four months after getting married, my husband and I had to fight for, my cus had to fight for custody for my stepson, Tony. That was a huge trigger for me. 
The court dates, parents' visits, and drama was too much. We fought so hard for him. No one except my parents knew about the situation, and I didn't want to talk about it because I cried every time. Cried of frustration and fear. I wasn't ready to be a mom. I felt like my whole world was being torn apart because this wasn't what I had asked for. I cried every day, and it tore my husband apart. The stress and frustration of the whole process was leading me up inside. But I had to move forward, and after six very long months, my husband gained full custody of Tony, and from that moment on, my life changed forever. But wait, that's not all. Soon after we married, I decided to petition for my husband's green card. Remember that issue I had mentioned in the beginning? Well, this is it. We are still in the process, and it has almost been two years since we started, which is the normal time frame. The process isn't what gets to me; it's the what ifs. If it wasn't enough having to prove that our marriage is indeed real and true, and paying all the very expensive fees, they make you wait long periods of time until you hear anything back, which gives you the time to sit there and imagine all the worst possible scenarios. If you have a significant other, I invite you to think of them in this moment. I invite you to close your eyes and think of the wonderful memories and adventures you have had with your significant other, and if it applies to you, your family. Are you taking amazing vacation trips? Or maybe you're sitting at the kitchen table, or eating takeout in the living room, or in, bed in your bedroom watching your favorite movies. Or maybe you're thinking about how lucky you are to see their face every morning and night. Think of all the things that annoy you about them. And now think about how all those things actually make you love them even more. Now imagine you wake up and your significant other isn't there anymore. Imagine the kids asking where their mom or their dad is and how come they haven't come home yet. What would you tell them? The truth, and how? Imagine that you have been separated by the only person who has ever made you happy, and even though they are still your partner, you can no longer. You can no longer laugh with someone. You no longer have someone to cry with, to argue with, to kiss. Now open your eyes, and I hope you realize that these are the thoughts that run through my head every day. And let me assure you, they are not the happiest of thoughts. My husband is still here, and many people think, "Oh, but you can go back to Mexico with him." True, but why should I if I'm a U.S. citizen? This is my country. I was born here, and I am proud of it as much as you are. It should be my natural-born right to have my husband in the same country as me. He hasn't done anything bad. He's not a criminal. He's a great father and a hardworking and respectful man. And how different is that from any other man? I began to see a therapist in 2019. And she had to write a letter for immigration stating that I have persistent depressive disorder and anxiety, which basically means that some days I'm okay, and some days I'm afraid of my own thoughts. My therapist had to prove to immigration that my mental health would be negatively affected if my husband were to leave the country. But doesn't that sound like common sense? Therapy has helped me in so many ways, and I want to say that it's okay to be in therapy. It could definitely be a hassle at times, but at least someone is willing to listen to you. I have gone through so much in just 23 years of my life, and there is so much more to my story. But these are the highlights of my journey with depression and anxiety. In my case, my depression is caused by different triggers, and remember, every person's depression is different. I may be going through a lot now, and I know life has many, many more things ahead for me. But just know that I am okay. Every day is definitely a battle, and I never know what it's going to bring me. But I grow stronger every day. If you are going through something right now, and no one else understands, just know that I am proof that you will be just fine. Life may have beaten me down when I was younger, but look at what I have now: a husband, a son who I consider my own, and it has made me appreciate the things I have now, because everything can definitely change in a second. I want to remind everyone that you are stronger than you think. And if you're battling your own mental illness right now, and you are sitting here right now and anywhere really, 
You are already winning, and it's simply because you are still here. Thank you. And now, <laughs> please welcome Larkin to the stage. Ready? Uh, so I'm going to be singing a song that I wrote called Butterflies, and it's about my anxiety. I've suffered from anxiety since I was seven years old, and I'm 17 now, so for 10 years. And this song is really the embodiment of the beauty of it and how embracing the anxiety has really changed my own life. When I was little, I used to catch butterflies with my grandpa in my backyard. Um, and so they were always a symbol of innocence and hope for me until I went to therapy and they told me to draw my anxiety and then I drew butterflies coming out of my stomach. So it's that juxtaposition of the meaning and symbol of a butterfly. Uh, so yeah, I hope you guys enjoy. <coughs> Shallow breathing in an aching heart Sometimes I just fall apart It's in my head I'm overthinking Getting in the way of my sleeping Melatonin in my system I can't sleep without it I'm anxiously walking and I'm anxiously talking Anxiously breathing, I'm anxiously thinking Butterflies come up inside my stomach I don't want them, but I am anxiously Falling apart Shaking hands, spinning head Everything I see is red I can't breathe, I take a breath Breathing fast, thinking slow Sometimes I just can't let go Little things and big things come around you could say there's always something Even if it feels like nothing I can't seem to find a time to sleep Butterflies are wild and crazy Just so frustrating I can't seem to find a time to think I'm anxiously walking And I'm anxiously talking I'm anxiously breathing, I'm anxiously sleeping Butterflies come up inside my stomach, I don't want them But I am anxiously falling apart Falling apart, I know my heart I'm falling apart, falling apart. Mm. I'm so, so proud to introduce Isaiah. I'm Isaiah. I'm loving, honest, caring, and friendly. I love my family, I love to be social, and my relationships mean the world to me. When I was younger, I had ADHD, anxiety, ODD, and sometimes depression. Christmas time, 2018, I had a psychotic break. Besides being on a bungee swing in Utah, this was the scariest time of my life. 
I couldn't talk, I couldn't eat for over a week, I couldn't sleep, and there were so many bad thoughts in my mind, I couldn't communicate and didn't understand what was happening to me. I ended up in a mental hospital. I thought I was dead and my mom was going to die. It took two times and about a month in the hospital and I had to spend Christmas there. I learned from the hospital that I have bipolar one manic with psychosis. This means my feelings can be all over the place and my mind can race with negative thoughts. I have to take medication to slow, to slow those things down. I do things to occupy my mind like focus on money because I love money and things I like and want to do. I don't mean to, but people say I interrupt a lot, ask for a lot of things, and don't let people talk to my mom. That's because with racing thoughts, I must let them out and might not notice what, is all, what else is going on. If your mind told you something bad would happen to your mom, you'd want all her time too. Most teenagers battle with who they are. I battle with my own mind every day. People confuse my diagnosis and my actions with who I am, but that does not define me. I'm Isaiah, I want to be accepted for who I am. I'm loving, honest, caring, and friendly. Thank you to everyone who supports me. Please welcome Daisy to the stage. Un día a la vez. Mi mamá me enseñó que siempre hay que seguir adelante. Keep pushing forward no matter the cause. My mental health journey started to make a lot more sense when I began to understand my family history. I am first generation Mexican American. Mi familia viene de Puebla, Mexico. There is a large percentage of the population in Puebla living in poverty, my family among that population. It is common for kids to drop out as early as primary school. Can you imagine that? My mom dropped out and began to work at the age of nine to help support her family financially. She learned the value of hard work and physical labor. Her brothers and sisters later to follow the same path. There was a stigma around mental health in my family. It was seen as selfish and something that's just in our heads. How can you think and put yourself first cuando hay cosas más importantes? My family didn't just grow up in poverty, but also in an abusive and alcoholic home. To them, the priority was making sure they had enough to pay the bills and take care of basic needs, while also surviving the domestic violence they would see between their parents. My mom being tired of seeing her mom cry and her brothers and sisters scared all the time led to her decision to move to the United States at the age of 17. Fue la primera en su familia en dejar su hogar y irse lejos. Going to a country she knows nothing about, not even the language, but she knew this was something she had to do for herself. My mom, Veronica Zamora, made a life for herself here in the States. As a single mother, she raised an older sister, younger brother, and me. My dad was an abusive partner. He was alcoholic and would physically abuse her. When I was three years old, my mom decided she would not only put her life at risk and my siblings at risk, or my life at risk, so she decided to leave. She decided to leave with just a few suitcases filled with just the essentials. I was only three years old my older sister six, and my younger brother one. With no money, a couple of suitcases, and three young children, my mom took us to live with one of her friends in Santana, California. Most of the time, we would be the four of us in a room at a stranger's house, but that's all she could afford at the time. It wasn't until my fifth grade year that my mom gave my siblings and I the news that we finally got the apartment that we always dreamt of. I was 12 years old when I went from being a happy, smiling, weird girl to quiet and closed out, from telling my mom everything to barely telling her anything. I couldn't quite understand what was going on with me, and it didn't happen overnight either, but it kept getting worse. I remember feeling alone in a house filled with people who loved me. I felt this pain inside of me, and it seemed like it took control over me and everything I would do. 
Most of the time I would be in bed. It seemed as if nothing, not even me, not anyone could get me out of it. I started to self-harm because I couldn't stand the emotional and mental pain I was in. I reached out for support from a teacher who thankfully connected me to a therapist. That was when I was diagnosed with chronic depression and anxiety disorder. When I was diagnosed, my mom would say, hay que seguir adelante y hay que ser fuerte. But during the time, I didn't feel like I could keep moving forward or be strong. I couldn't even deal with anything. I didn't want to live. I couldn't explain to my mom that. I knew all the challenges and hardships she had to face to get us to where we are now. I even carried that stigma that it was selfish to feel what I felt. I couldn't get myself to explain how real it was what I was feeling. All I knew at the time that it would, felt horrible. I could be anywhere and these horrible feelings and thoughts would start. I would be sitting down in class, trying to concentrate on the lesson, pay attention to the math problems or read the book. But I couldn't, I couldn't focus. I mean, would you be able to focus if all you can think about is suicide and these horrible, overwhelming feeling that you're worthless? Yeah, I didn't think so. I attempted suicide twice at the ages of 13 and 14, which led to me being hospitalized for a few days at the second attempt. At the hospital, my family's faces were filled with sadness, anger, confusement, and most of all, disappointment. My younger brother, however, told me, and he knew that he knew I wasn't trying to be selfish, but rather, he told me, it is time for me to take the support I need and do this for myself. It was those words I needed to heal, for me to actually receive the support I needed. It was a struggle to get my mom to understand what was going on with my mental health, since she didn't grow up with the terms or even knowing that mental health is real. However, she listened to what I had to share. I listened to because I wasn't the only one in my family struggling with mental health. By receiving support from a therapist and sharing out my mental health journey, it not only broke the long toxic cycle that began in my family, but also began the healing process. This is my brave nose, the power in storytelling and how storytelling saves lives. That is exactly what saved my life. I found power in sharing my story and letting my voice be heard. My chronic depression and anxiety disorder is something I have to live with to this day. Pero hay que seguir adelante. I am proud to say that I am 17 years old and I am alive moving forward. Thank you. It is my honor to present Sasha. Good luck. Hey. Um, so when I wrote this song, I was letting everything out and putting it to the surface, making it known of what I used to feel. When I wrote this, I wasn't doing my best, so it describes what I used to feel and how I felt in that very moment. <laughs> Before I start, I just want everyone to know that you'll be okay and that you got this. Don't let your crowns fall. You are all kings and queens. You just have to be patient. I promise, take my word for it. Take you back to when I was so sad that I tried to take my own life. When I used to cut, when I used to starve myself, that's how much I hated being alive. No 
nobody remembers and how they treated me no one used to see how much i cried i tried to be the perfect little me i tried to be what you all wanted me to be but i'm not i'm just me and i've lived this long to see that that's all i'm gonna be right now i feel so broken right now i feel so empty right now i feel this pain and suffering if you look into my eyes you'll see it too I've cried alone I've smoked and smoked I felt so alone I'm just me, I'm me And that's all I'm gonna be I've been happy I've cried Do you see the tears in my eyes? <laughs> And it is my pleasure to welcome a great poet, Elizabeth. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Elizabeth. It is a blessing to have this opportunity to share my story with you all. I hope that by sharing bits and pieces of my life, you can all relate to me and find comfort and healing. Nine years old, I was sexually abused by my neighbor. I couldn't figure out how to forgive myself because I believed it was all my fault. I isolated myself from everyone. I wanted to tell an adult and get the weight lifted off of my chest, but whenever I tried, I was too scared and I felt ashamed. I couldn't find the courage within myself to speak up and get help. I dreaded life, knowing that I had so many years left to live. I was only in the fourth grade, suffering with severe depression. I believed that death would be the only way I was set free. My biggest coping mechanism was food. I found so much comfort in eating. I didn't even realize that there was a problem. 11 years old, I began middle school, and I began getting bullied by classmates, friends, and family members. I was a lot shorter at the time, and people told me that I was fat. They called me names like Oompa Loompa, Tomato, or said that I had cottage cheese thighs. This may sound like something you hear in a movie, but sadly, this was my reality. I didn't feel beautiful on the inside or outside, and this was a struggle for me. Age 13, it was summertime, and I got drunk at my best friend's house. Not knowing my limits, I ended up with alcohol poisoning, and I couldn't get out of bed for two days. I didn't seek medical attention because I was too scared to tell my mom that I had been drinking alcohol. I knew I would get scolded and never be allowed at a friend's house again. Within a few days of the alcohol poisoning, I began to lose weight rapidly. My friends and family noticed, but I had no explanation. Summer ended, school was back in session, and everyone noticed I had lost a ton of weight. People made comments about how much prettier I looked. Boys showed me more attention, 
and I no longer struggled to make friends. And no one called me names or made fun of me anymore. It seems like a happy ending, except for the fact that I had a false perception of reality. Nothing was wrong with me when I weighed more either. Yet I developed a fear of being fat. I associated being liked and having an easier life with being skinny. I was so scared of gaining weight that I began to starve myself and battle with anorexia. I wasn't kind to myself, and I would beat myself up if I ever ate enough to feel full. Age 17, I was in counseling, trying to help myself. I told my counselor that I had a crush, but he told me, I don't think dating is a good idea for you. I suggest that you stay single and work on yourself. Two weeks later, I started dating my high school sweetheart and never went back to that counselor again. In reality, though, my counselor was right. I shouldn't have been in a relationship. I wasn't emotionally stable, and my thoughts were a mess. But I had a crush on this boy since I was 13 years old. There was no way I was going to walk away from him without at least trying. In the very beginning, things between us were amazing. I felt like he was the best thing that ever happened to me. I found the love and comfort I was looking for in him instead of searching for it and finding it within myself. I left my chaotic home and moved in with him. My depression was the worst it had been in a long time. We smoked marijuana all day. I quit caring about my appearance because I got comfortable around him. I began to gain weight, plus I had the munchies 24-7, so that helped too. It wasn't long before things between me and him got abusive, both mentally and physically. We both lacked respect, and we brought out the ugliest parts of each other. Three years withered away, but we couldn't let go because we were both codependent. In the last year of being together, I was at the lowest point I've ever been in my life. Marijuana turned into Xanax, cocaine, Norcos, Percocets, the list goes on and on. I was losing myself, and things continued on like this for a while. Age 20, I woke up one day, and I was tired of being on drugs, tired of feeling suicidal, and just plain tired of being tired. I got on my hands and knees and spoke to the universe. I said, are you real, God? If you are, then please reveal yourself to me and help me, because I can't seem to help myself. I am ready to be drug-free and have control over my emotions. If things are going to be like this forever, I don't know how I will make it to the end. Within two days, I was gravitated to the doorstep of a woman who I hadn't spoke to since I was 13 years old. The timing was truly divine. She opened up her KJV Bible and began to read to me and preach about Jesus Christ. We talked for hours, and I knew the Bible was truth because chills kept flowing through me as if I was being hit by a gust of wind. It made all the hairs on my entire body stand up tall. I was at my skinniest point, not from anorexia, but from drug abuse. God used this woman to reveal himself to me. She fed me, motivated me, and brought me to her church. I have to give all glory to Jesus Christ because he answered my prayer. He saved my life and showed me what it feels like to be truly loved. I'm not perfect, and no one is. This past year has had its ups and downs. I gave in to temptation many times, but that's life. We all make mistakes, and thankfully the Holy Spirit always pulls me back onto the path of the straight and narrow. I'm 21 years old now. I'm in college full time, and I'm a straight A student. I do my best to remain drug free and surround myself with positive, healthy people. I maintain my weight through a healthy diet and regular exercise. I have overcome my fear of food, and I don't starve or neglect my body. I have control over my thoughts, and I learn techniques for if I ever feel like I'm starting to lose control. I wake up on time for things, and when I wake up, I'm happy to be alive. I thank God every morning for allowing me to see another day. I have the power to say no to things that aren't good for my spirit, even if my flesh may crave them. And thankfully, I have a big group of people who are supporting me. I'm not a perfect person, but I try my best, and I know that I am loved. I've learned to grow through what I go through. 
Excited this year, I'll be 22. And I'm praying for all of you. Thank you and amen. Up next is going to be the amazing Chris. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm doing a dance piece today, and it is a love letter to my past self um, to let them know that it's okay to be alone and it's okay to not be okay. Um, and if you are ever feeling lonely, it's okay to reach out because without sorrow, there is no joy. I'm so wide, full in, seen it, tried it, I die fully. I'm not tonight's when I get my lessons. Learned apples, cherries, pain, breathe in, breathe out, pain. No, 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 the king still me to my grace. How come the more you have, the more the people want from you? More you burn away, the more the people earn from you. More you pull away, the more that they depend on you. I've never seen a hero like me in a sci-fi. So I wonder if you need to remember me. I wonder if you think that I can ever raise you up. I wonder if you think that I can ever help you fly. I've never seen a hero like me in a sci-fi. And now, give it up for an amazing writer and poet, Michael. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hello. My name is Michael Ruprecht. I'm 20 years old, and I've lived here in Napa since I was about seven. 
Uh, I do hope you're enjoying the show uh, this afternoon. It's an honor to be here in front of you performing a piece of mine today. So, let's begin. Stop me if you've heard this one before. This guy thinks he's got to wash his hands way more than he needs to. He touches doorknobs, he has to go wash his hands, it's that kind of thing. He's got a routine in the morning for how he gets ready. It goes prayer, brush teeth, but brush teeth in increments of seven, and then apply deodorant in increments of four swipes, and apply cologne, increments of four sprays. Always after, never before, or else you start over. Oh yeah, and uh, underwear, pants, belts, uh, but if you miss the belt, you also start over. And then the shirt. And leave the room thinking a good thought. But that's the kicker for him, because he can't stop the bad thoughts. Nevertheless, make sure that your body leaves the door frame thinking a good thought, unless you want to start over. Like I said, stop me if you've heard this one before. As a kid, he didn't really play with his toys. It was more like organizing them. He would line them up and admire his handiwork. And you know, bathrooms can be the worst. Dirt, germs, bodily fluids, debilitating for him. That's everywhere with zero evidence. He's used an arsenal of household cleaning products. If this thing had its way, he would clean himself to death. His entire existence erased, cleaned away. Stop me if you've heard this one before. At this point, he stopped letting himself near sharp things, anything that could hurt someone. Because when he looks in the mirror, that reflection shows back a monster. But why would he do that? Why would he do such things? It makes no sense. But he is scared for his life. He is scared for the life of his loved ones, for the lives of everyone around him. He is scared of himself. He keeps seeing himself going through with it, going through with it, ending it all. It's getting to be too much. You can stop me if you've heard this one before. It's the one where, it's the one where he's seeing things and, and hearing things. But, but, not, but not, like, not like seeing things and hearing things. You know, it's, it's these images and these thoughts and these scenes of these things that pain him. These things that he knows he's not. But what if it means nothing? What if it means something? What if it means everything? Where is it coming from? What is happening to him? He clearly needs help. Someone should help him. Help me! Please stop me if you've heard this one before. Because it all has to be perfect. Everything has to be perfect. Perfect, 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 perfect. Stop me if you've heard this one before. Love of all things has become tricky for him. The thoughts latch onto it. His haven, his very own haven, even lost. These images and scenes are haunting, unwanted, horrifying. Where do these even come from? Why him? He just wants to love to be loved, to feel love again. He needs love. I want to live again. Make it stop me if you've heard this one before. The thoughts tell him he's not who he says he is, that he's not who he knows he is, and that is a blunt knife cut through the chest. He can't look at people. He can't look at loved ones. He can't look at himself. He's scared. He's haunted. He's hunted. All while he smiles at gatherings to friends and family, Stop me if you've heard this one before. At his lowest point, he wonders if God even hears him, or if God's mad at him, if he's lost in some darkness, if he's lost light, faith, God, Christ, who he had known his whole life. He fears he's hopeless. Stop me if you've heard this one before. The obsessions won't cease. The compulsions must happen or else. Or else, why? Well, it never really told me exactly, or clearly for that matter, but I think it told me I would go insane, for lack of a better word. I might not, but what if? What if 
I become everything that I am not. That would kill me. To know thyself and to be told you are not who you know you are is painful, cruel, agony. But listen to me. After years of this fight, I know who I am. I know it will not kill me. I have been through it. I have been beaten, battered, bruised, and left bloody, but I never gave up, and I never will. Every day, I am at war until this mental tyranny reigns no more. Tell me, friend, have you heard this one before? Obsessive compulsive disorder. I live with OCD. Have you heard this one before? It's no joke. Thank you. I'd like to welcome to the stage another poet. Please welcome Emily. Hello, my name is Emily Long and I am 15 years old. For the last few years, I have struggled with my mental health, including issues with eating, body image, anxiety, panic attacks, and depression. The best way for me to describe it is as if my world went black and white. Just over a year ago, I was hospitalized for suicidal ideation. That was my lowest point. I went to inpatient, then outpatient treatment. And I met some amazing people who helped me next, through the next three months. I would go to program, and then home. Now, I get up, go to school, enjoy myself. The poem I'm about to read to you is about how far I've come in this short time, and how proud of myself I am for not giving in. One year ago, I was utterly sick. I was at my all-time low, and it happened quite quick. I would felt I wasn't enough, that I wasn't so tough. But now I'm so proud I got past my storm cloud. I wore my scars proud and very loud. With a smile on my face, I have won my race. I have come so far and have more to go. With the twinkle of a star, I have learned how to grow. It felt like forever to get here, but it was not long ago but I'm not about to disappear, and I'm just like, whoa. I'm proud of my journey, though it involved a gurney, because one year ago, I wasn't so sturdy, and now I can't wait to make it to 30. Thank you. I am proud to welcome Kevin X. Hello, everybody. Uh, from where you're seated, can we interact? Can you look around from where you're seated? Look for someone who looks like you in regards of age, ethnicity, and gender. Now look for someone who looks like me. Thank you. Racist institutions built to keep us up in check. Then they walk away and turn around and label us a threat. They say our history is worthless and that there isn't anything to connect with, meaning our stories will always be rejected and neglected, that our languages were only just a dialect. But they expect me to stay quiet and ask no questions and to trust a badge with no patience. A uniform that is a plot line film that can easily end with a chalk outline to make a body look stylish for a camera full of RIP hashtags. The childish politicians, Congress elects, run into our neighborhoods and make us deject. They say they will fix our roads and stabilize our communities, but they only meant that for the tourism. No resource, recreational centers for us to do. It seems like we're the tourists trying to find new ways to have fun and new ways to be seen. Two split realities stuck in between. Mental health is a real thing. The struggles at home with the Namptons of a father who may rest in peace. 
a hard-working mother with no emotion, an older brother that likes to rumble, a broken home, a broken home with thick walls that are chaotic screams bounce back and forth, that they're so loud the giants on the floor are getting disturbed. And as the sweat and tears went down as steep streams of stress, it cuts and cuts into the deep of the rocks. And as it drips and swirls and turns in, into the back of my mouth, it's ascetic. The paramedics storm and rush into the house of our starvation. Masculation taught me to never receive consultation. No llores porque eres macho. They told me to hang my emotions in a gancho. No mattresses but blankets and pillows on the floors. And when morning rose, the bad influences came around. While mama was on the ground, her hunchback was getting down to the root of the vine. Her spine didn't even have a straight line. And in the evening we froze. My little sister wanted more, but the pain was too hard to control. And by telling her no, made her question the unknown. Growing up made it hard to believe the people who call me the bro. Cause you see, long ago, I wish tomorrow wouldn't go. I should have listened to mama cause I could have gone to go see the medico. Mother's feet ached right around fall. Michael raked the leaves. Sister prayed at the tomb of his feet. Brother paid the fees while I massaged her bumpy, rigid, rusty, stiff, stinky feet. Later did I know that her life has always been incomplete. You see, she sacrificed leaving her birthland to search for a dream. I said, to search for a dream, so she fled hundreds of miles to relive another nightmare. She had an affair, so she had an affair with work. We didn't have no child care, so we went on to the corner store to go see what needed to be restored in the empty cabinets of ours. No devotion. A broken home, a broken home with cracked ceilings without windows. I just thought the components of slavery ended long ago. Now the omen has spoken. No more broken glass. The wounds have become scars and turned into cosmic stars that connect strictly towards the gods. After plugging in cords into the holes of my heart, I began winning awards. I began grinning some more. Man, it felt good. But I didn't stop there. It began my summer going into my freshman year where I discovered the passion for knowledge, where the images on my casket began fading away. When I started to blossom and bloom, the losses became lessons and mama stopped stressing. F's and D's became A's and B's. Learning happened when I traveled to different parts of Aslan. I started looking like a galan. Carlos Valdovinos Catalan was his name, and now I do it for him. And now I remember my family overcame the struggle, the sacrifices that were made, the late nights we stayed up asking for guidance, the days we skipped meals, kept my mom's head over her heels, the years that were stagnant and dark implemented themselves as stress marks. It's remarkable we stood tall on the shoulders of my mother, it's amazing we pulled through the struggle. Gracias. <laughs> and now, up next, we have the turtlenecks. Turtlenecks, and um, today we're going to be singing a song that we wrote. Um, it's called Jump Around, and it's written in part about my struggle with anxiety. Um, and I think that's really evident throughout the song if you're able to uh, listen to the lyrics. Uh, so we're really excited to perform, and thank you. Sometimes I wonder why we have two legs and not four to five feet 
the walls are wide, but why am I so goddamn ugly? My life's a national geographic waste of time, but I still love me. The blanket covering my eyes just disappeared, and it's so lovely. Oh no. Sometimes I walk around, scream around, watch the silent colors on the TV, baby. Sometimes I jump around, dance around, waiting for the turtles to outrun me. I caught the Joey syndrome just the other day, I think it's deadly. I looked outside my window yesterday, but I could not see. I often wonder what it's like to be the new breed. I'll start collecting all my thoughts to make a medley, oh no. Sometimes I walk around, scream around, watch the silent colors on the TV, baby. Sometimes I jump around, dance around, waiting for the turtles to outrun me. Sometimes I walk around, scream around, watch the silent colors on the TV, baby. Sometimes I jump around, dance around, waiting for the turtles to outrun me. Sometimes I walk around, scream around, watch the silent colors on the TV. Sometimes I jump around, dance around, waiting for the turtle to outrun me. Yeah! As you can have experienced, our brave cast was able to shine a light today on a topic we don't talk about enough. I'd like to take a moment to ask all of you, our audience, to be brave with us. And to stand, please, if you yourself have experienced a mental health disorder, or if you love someone who has, please stand. And you can look around. We are all affected by mental illness. And simply being here today was an incredible start to building upon a movement of people who are willing to be more supportive and open to those struggling. We hope that you'll think of This Is My Brave and that you'll use this experience you've shared with us today in a way to start the conversation and keep it going. That is what it means to live brave. If you were moved by what you witnessed here tonight, and today, and you'd like to make a contribution to This Is My Brave to help them continue this vitally important work, please check out the back cover of your program for more information about how to make a donation. And thank you so much for your support. 
We'd love to meet you in the lobby where we can gather and visit and learn about the resources provided by some of our sponsors. Also, you can find resources at the Mental Health Bookstore being sponsored by Napa Bookmine. But first, how about one more round of applause for our storytellers? 